Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, good afternoon. My name is Trevor Hughes, and I'm the president and CEO of the IAPP, the International Association of Privacy Professionals. I am delighted to welcome you here today for this panel on autonomous vehicles, trolley problems, and how to deal with them. Let me start by expressing some gratitude to Paul DeHert and Rosamund, the entire team with CPDP. Yet again, this is another wonderful conference. I love uh, this conference every time I have a chance to, to, to come to it, and I think we should all be grateful for the hard work that they do. Um, and for the tough issues that they tackle. And there is perhaps no thornier issue, no more challenging space than the one that we are uh, going to address today with this expert panel that we have pulled together. We're gonna be exploring the intersection of AI, connected cars, autonomous vehicles, and data ethics. And we're gonna be doing it in the most applied, practical way possible. And uh, I'm gonna start with a caveat and that is that I'm certainly not an expert in this space, and I actually hope that makes me a better moderator because I will ask dumb questions on your behalf. Um, I will explore issues that don't seem quite resolved and push our panelists a little bit. Um, and now let me introduce our panelists because we really have pulled together a tremendous group of experts. I'm gonna start to my immediate left and then go down. Uh, we are delighted to be joined by Sophie Nerbon, who is with the CNIL, the French regulator at the CNIL. Sophie is the director of co-regulation, a new role recently created in the wake of GDPR to implement GDPR more effectively around France and beyond. To Sophie's left is uh, uh, Andrea Lisievich. How did I do? Well done. Good. Um, Andrea is the head of data protection compliance for Volvo Cars, and she was at great pains to indicate that that is not Volvo Trucks. So this is not an automated truck conversation. We will be talking about automated cars. Um, two, uh, Andrea's left is Chelsea Colbert, who is in a new role, actually, as policy counsel for the Future of Privacy Forum, where she tackles issues such as mobility and connected vehicles. Welcome, Chelsea. And then to Chelsea's left is Miko Niva, who is the Chief Privacy Officer of Vodafone. Welcome, Miko. Okay, we are gonna start with an absolutely enormous promise, and that is, and I'll oversell this a bit, we are going to solve the trolley problem by the end of this panel. Uh, for all of you, like me, who took ethics in college or university, law school somewhere, and were presented with the trolley problem, we actually have the right answer. We figured it out and we'll share it with you before the end. That means stay to the end. Um, but if you'll remember the trolley problem from ethics, it's a fairly straightforward problem. There's a runaway trolley and it's on a track and you are operating a switch. If you do nothing, the trolley will barrel ahead and kill four people who are standing on the track beyond the switch. If you throw the switch, the trolley will turn and still barrel ahead and kill one person. And so the question is, in all ethics classes around the world, given the trolley problem, what do you do? Do you throw the switch or you do, do you not throw the switch? Now, I remember this problem. Actually, Chelsea and I attended the same university in Canada. We're both Canadians, Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. And I don't remember the professor, I don't remember the grade, but I certainly remember the trolley problem. And the only thing that I can remember from my studies at that time is that if I was Jeremy Bentham or a utilitarian, that poor single person is dead, dead, dead. That's all I can remember. We'll see if that's still the result after our panel today. Um, but certainly this is a question that comes up often when we talk about autonomous vehicles, connected cars because there will be moments where these vehicles are going to have to make decisions on our behalf. There will be algorithmic decision-making that occurs that has consequences in real life. And I think the question that we want to tackle is what are the policy protections that we wrap around that? How do we operationalize those policy protections inside organizations? What are the considerations that organizations need to tackle? So with that, why don't we dive in? Okay, 
Andre, I'm actually going to start with you, given that you work at Volvo, a car manufacturer that's working on smart cars, connected cars. But the fact is that not all cars are smart. In fact, we often confuse the role of technology within automobiles. And when we were preparing for the panel, you shared with us a framework for clarifying exactly what we're talking about. And I think that would be a good framing exercise for us. So can you help us with that? What are the stages of autonomous vehicles? How should we be defining things so that we have better clarity as we move forward? Thanks for that. Um, well, first of all, I would say that cars nowadays are smart. Um, but the degree in which they are smart varies. <laughs> So, of course, uh, we have level zero. It actually starts from zero, which is no automation. Uh, it's basically the driver needs to do everything. Um, then we have level one, which is also called hands-on. So the driver still does mostly everything, but the car is equipped with a few very basic uh, automation features like lane keeping uh, assistance and um, uh, speed, uh, speed keeping and, and things like that. Then we have the level two called um, hands off in the sense that the car can take over the driving function in certain situations. So it's still fairly limited and the driver needs to be able to intervene uh, within seconds of being given warning by the car. Then we have level uh, three, which is called uh, eyes off. So the car can actually take over the driving function for longer periods of time. For example, on freeways. So when situations are not that complicated, you do have uh, some, some sort of autonomous drive. And of course, the driver still needs to be there and intervene. But uh, the autonomous driving function is much uh, longer in time and, and in space. And then level four and five are considered the real autonomous driving and the goal where we as a society would like to, to be. Um, and the, uh, the difference between them, level four is called mind off and uh, level five is called person off. The difference between them is that level four allegedly still needs in some situations, human intervention. So there will still be a cockpit, there will still be a wheel and, and pedals. So there will still be, in some very exceptional situations, a human driver, although the car is actually autonomous. But in level five, there is no more driver. Everyone in the car is a passenger. There is no wheel, there are no pedals, there is no possibility for the human to intervene even if they want to. So that is the societal goal, uh, which actually reigns in the benefits of uh, autonomous drive, which is um, tests show that it can actually uh, reduce uh, accidents to under 1% of the level that we have today. And uh, of course, lower uh, carbon gas emissions and so on and so forth. Of course, this doesn't come without society negative impacts, but we're not here today to discuss about that. Uh, but still, uh, the key point is that the benefits of autonomous drive would be reached and would be seen and felt in the society if we reach at least a 90% usage of autonomous driving cars. Okay, so that's really helpful. So actually six categories if you include level zero with nothing, going from hands-on to hands-off to eyes-off, mind-off, and then person-off, um, varying degrees of the autonomy of the vehicle. What is the highest state of the art in the marketplace currently? What is the, what is the most advanced that we would see on the road currently? Well, I would say that society today is somewhere at level two. Some would say even a little bit of level three. Yep. Um, of course, it, it's not really rocket science, so it's, we don't have a checklist. If you do this, that, and that, you're at level two. If you do this extra thing, you're at level three. So it really depends who is looking at it. But, uh, so there is some debate over whether we have reached level three. But at level two, I think that it's pretty safe to say that we are. Excellent. Let's talk about the actual technologies involved. One of the things that I'm interested in, and Miko, I'm gonna to come to you here, and then Sophie, I'd like you to react to this. Miko, help us understand the technologies that are involved or the roles that are involved. So Andrea has given us a really helpful framing of the various degrees of autonomy of vehicles. 
Now let's talk about what are the component parts? Who is involved and what is their role? Take us through that list. Yeah, let's, let, let's give it a go, uh, uh, or, or a try at least. So I think when, when we talk about autonomous driving, we should uh, absolutely remember that we are probably in the stage of connected driving currently. Uh, and, and, and we are adding various degrees of our autonomy to it, as we, as we just heard. But um, to me, the best way to frame kind of like who's actually doing what in this, uh, this area is to think of it as an ecosystem where you have multiple different types of uh, players doing, you know, providing different type of services and, and, and technologies uh, uh, to support the connected driving. So you, you have the, the OEM, that's uh, industry jargon, I guess, for the car manufacturer. Uh, uh, but then you have <clears throat> uh, multiple uh, software running on that car. Uh, there's entertainment systems, but, but there are like uh, 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 the, the software that, that actually runs the car, supports the, the running of the car. There would be all kinds of hardware sensors, monitoring the brakes, the engine condition, all that connected to, 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 to the uh, various computers that run uh, on the car. Uh, more and more we see sort of like third party service providers using this, 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 this OEM and the software in it as a platform perhaps to offer their own services. So you have Apple, CarPlay, uh, uh, you could probably sell uh, all kinds of applications, entertainment. Uh, uh, movies, navigation services, making use of the, the computing capacity uh, on the car. Uh, then you have the, the connectivity providers, so Vodafone is, is, is among those, but we are also a player in the, in the value-added services business. We provide insurance services, uh, uh, sort of like, uh, you know, behavioral uh, 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 discounts, uh, uh, as an example, or crash monitoring services, and, 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 and the list is quite long. And then you would probably have, uh, the more we move towards the, the full uh, uh, autonomous uh, uh, ecosystem, we have various types of support services. The cars are actually emitting information around them, informing other cars, uh, about what goes on in the, in, in the traffic, informing emergency services. If it's fully automated driving, that probably needs to be connected to a back end that supports the driving. Uh, so it's a very complex ecosystem. Mm. Okay, so Andrea has given us the um, various degrees of autonomy involved with the car. Miko has just given us a very comprehensive view of the complexity of the ecosystem that exists within and around the car everything from the OEM, the original equipment manufacturer, and I would guess, Andre, you would consider Volvo to be an OEM in this situation, is that right? So the car manufacturer, there's an operating system, there's actual software that plugs into that car to operate the, um, uh, the autonomous driving functions, and then there are also apps, if you will, other software services that plug in through the vehicle. Could be entertainment, could be weather, could be navigation, could be any sorts of things that plug in through that vehicle. Value-added services get layered on top of that. The hardware, the sensors, the other things involved, they have a role. Uh, Miko represents Vodafone, which is a carrier or a connectivity service. You need to have this car talking. Um, to the web, and that has to happen through some mechanism. There's another player in the environment. And then also the support services around it. We shouldn't lose sight of the fact that smart cities, smart roads, smart lampposts, smart streetlights may also be part of this broader ecosystem as well, and they have organizations, governments, and entities behind them as well. So, Sophie, help us understand, are we thinking about this the right way? As an ecosystem of data, of data uses, of experiences, is that the right way for us to be framing this broader discussion? Absolutely, and uh, I must say that uh, uh, the complexity uh, goes further with the autonomous car compared to the connected cars, because we, a few years ago, uh, issued a, a collective work with all the, per the persons involved you were speaking about uh, in um, what we call the compliance package on connected vehicles and personal data 
to try to connect uh, the new needs about connected vehicles, um, being privacy by design, and we worked with not only, of course, the car manufacturers, but the equipment uh, car industry and the insurance uh, sector, uh, the telecom sector, uh, some startups, and of course, all the public authorities in charge of uh, regulating. Um, I don't know if the microphone is still back. working. Yep. Yes, it's back. And uh, the more autonomous a vehicle is, and the more it is actually dependent on data, and a very large proportion of the data is personal data, as it is linked directly or indirectly, and that was at the beginning when we began the work with uh, the French car industry, I must say that was not clear at all for them that that was personal data. And they, they were telling us, but we have just technical data. And when we were explaining that you could link those technical data to the driver, uh, of course, uh, they understood that that was the beginning of a collective thinking with three scenarii that we elaborated with all of them. And uh, uh, of course, uh, we had the insurance companies on one side and uh, uh, the other industries, so very competitive uh, aspects. But on this uh, good understanding on the regulation about personal data, and we have done this job having in mind the GDPR, because uh, of course we had to, in, to, to use this new, uh, because that was issued at the end of uh, the year 2017, but yet that was with the GDPR uh, being in, in mind, uh, but not the e-privacy uh, directive. And now that this uh, work done at the French level is uh, pushed at the European level, uh, we have to find a consensus between all data protection authorities in Europe to issue some guidelines on those connected cars. So I say that, uh, I believe that effectively you, you have to have in mind, and that's not an easy task, uh, this mapping of all uh, the, the, the actors. And it's even more complicated when you see that the uh, boundaries between industries falling down. We have Vodafone on the, on the panel for speaking about autonomous car and the say yes in Las Vegas uh, this year. Uh, you had Sony uh, presenting a car. Uh, Amazon being involved with uh, the implementation of uh, Alexa in cars. Uh, so that's also, um, we see uh, the boundaries between industries uh, being uh, moving. Mm. So. Fascinating. So, um, yet again, a, a description of the complexity of the environment. Uh, we've described it as an ecosystem. Uh, we've described some of the data relationships. Sophie has introduced the idea that we have existing law that we have to consider how it applies to these scenarios. Um, we've also, I think, worked around the idea of it as a platform, that the autonomous vehicle is something of a platform. And we have other platforms that we may be able to take some analogies from. It seems to me, though, that we've forgotten one really important part. Sophie mentioned personal data. Much of this involves a person. Um, and so Chelsea, uh, let's bring you in in a big way now. Help us understand what is the role of the, the driver or the non-driver, the person who's just sitting there checking their email while this autonomous vehicle takes them to work or to the grocery store or wherever it might be. How should we be thinking about the individual in this experience and their agency, their autonomy, as they go through the experience of being driven somewhere? Yeah, this is, this is great. I'm really glad that we're starting with this, with this talk about the bigger picture, the ecosystem, the smart city, because the connected car, the autonomous vehicle is not just the standalone 
um, thing anymore. It's really going to be connected into everything. And I'll just take one second to plug some material from FPF. So if you want a really accessible way of thinking about this broader ecosystem and the different data collected, because um, I know this space can be really jargon heavy um, when we start to use terms like V2X, like vehicle to everything, V2I, infrastructure, and then P, pedestrian. So some really good resources. You can find some hard copies from my colleagues in the back, Sarah and Rob. Uh, Rob's back there, uh, also online. Uh, but yeah, so it's really great to keep this bigger picture in mind when we start to think about who. Who are these people and the humans that are in this ecosystem? So we're going to be moving from the driver to the passengers to the people standing around the car when you have the car talking with other cars. So the car will not only have cameras inside, outside, um, the car will be able to talk to other cars so, and to other infrastructure in the city. So the car is going to be able to see with the eyes, if you will, of other cars in the space and also start to ping off um, the cell phones that pedestrians are holding. So yeah, it's really important to keep this in mind when we start really trying to unravel what are the different types of data that's being collected and, and who's involved in this and do we need really more sensitive type of information like biometrics, location, or just more higher level aggregate non-personal information. Miko, just a quick uh, anecdote from the Mobile World Congress last year, which was the first time when we saw the, uh, uh, some of the big car manufacturers in a mobile world congress. Mm. Not there, it seemed like they were there as, uh, of course, as car manufacturers, but also as data companies. And some of the, 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 the concept cars that we saw there were quite fascinating. I'm, I'm not sure how soon we will see them, if ever. But you, 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 you could almost like, need, you would almost, almost like start to think of the car as, your, as a moving living room. With sofas in it, you know, the driver's seat just kind of like turns like this and Okay, just, I'm in. Yeah, like I'm. I'm. That, really that's actually the, the, the yeah. Volvo concept car <laughs> yeah. for autonomous yeah, that, drive. It may have been the Volvo. <laughs> I'm in. One. But then you, you start to see how much of any kind of uh, uh, data could be collected from. Of that. course. Yeah, just to add on to that too, Please. like what you're saying about the the living room. The car yeah. is not just um, like this car that we drive to work or to the grocery store, but it's the living room. So moving beyond the personal car ownership. I think trending, we'll start to see connected cars AV used in other applications um, more than the personal car ownership. And that um, is for, I think, two main reasons. The, the fleet, the car share, the ride hailing allows more data collection and more different types of data collection. And also just like from a hardware um, technical perspective, um, it'll be easier to have less car ownership. So we'll see like AV rental, car share, the ride hailing, um, employees, so that brings up employee privacy, um, delivery, so no humans at all involved in it. So delivery on public right of way, sidewalks, even freight underground. So a lot of different applications, um, ground, air, transportation, micromobility. Okay, public stop, Chelsea, stop. I'm so getting so a lot of layers to this so, that different people um, about. Actually, as a novice in this space, and again, I will fess up to the fact that I, I'm not an expert. I am a novice in this space. It's been fascinating talking to our panel in prep in preparation because there are just layers and layers of complexity. So we started this last uh, round of dialogue around the people involved. And I was initially thinking about the person sitting in the car who might be um, hands on, hands off, eyes off, mind off. They may be engaged in various levels, but I was thinking about the person. And then I also thought, oh, there's passengers. But Chelsea broadened it even further. There's bystanders on the road. There's drivers of other cars. There is an incredibly complex set of relationships that exist. Um, and then we've gone even further from that because context matters, it turns out. Uh, so Chelsea's introduced the idea that you don't just use vehicles for personal use, you also use them for professional use. So there's employment context that we need to layer into this. There are other contexts in which autonomous vehicles may actually be used. We've started with a, an exploration of some of the data relationships involved. Are there other um, consumer protection or human right interests that we should also be adding to our discussion. Andrea or Sophie, maybe you could start us on this conversation and I open it to the whole panel. Are there 
other issues other than data privacy that we should be thinking about as we are starting to tackle and work through some of these issues? Andrea, yeah, why don't for you start? Sure. For sure, but of course it's not something for the privacy professionals in us to, to deal with, but the, the introduction of autonomous drive will, will change society, basically, because there are many, many uh, aspects that feed into ethics, and we'll get to the, the trolley uh, problem later on. Um, economic impact, because of course, still today, uh, the autonomous cars would be much more expensive. Um, and the state will need to find a way to um, incentivize both the production of autonomous cars and also the purchase of autonomous cars. Uh, right now, there is a little bit of um, a weird ecosystem of uh, certification requirements and licensing requirements for autonomous cars because uh, there are states that have requirements and states that don't have requirements even just to test autonomous cars on the public roads, uh, let alone to actually have them in personal use on the roads. Um, nobody really knows who will be considered the driver, so who will need to have the driving license. Will it be the OEM? Will it be the person that purchases the car? Uh, should it be the state even, because society benefits as a whole from this? So, it, or the software provider uh, that's actually controlling the autonomous functions of the car. So those are still questions that uh, are not answered fully today. And let's not forget uh, the, because you just mentioned this, the employment context. People will lose jobs. And especially in the professional services, uh, professional drivers, at least in the US, account for a very large proportion of the working population and they will lose those jobs. Yeah. So there's gonna be a bit of a, society crisis, unrest, whatever. It's, it's a bit of an industrial revolution at, at uh, another level. So yeah, it, it's, it's much, more, uh, m m much more than just the privacy aspect. If I'm not mistaken, the most common job title in the United States is driver. And so, so, so I read. one can expect massive disruption. In yeah, and, and it's not just the professional uh, drivers like lorry drivers, taxi drivers. Sure. Chelsea was just mentioning uh, hill, uh, hill riding apps. Those will also be autonomous cars. Wow. So we won't have the Uber driver, the taxi driver, the person that delivers your, um, your packages and so on. So a lot of disruption on, on that level. Got it. Sophie, help us understand, are there other human rights or consumer protection issues? Now, I know you are a data protection regulator, mm -hmm. but expand out a bit further. Are there other issues? Andrea suggested that even in the ownership structures for new autonomous vehicles, there may be concerns associated with socioeconomic status and access to these technologies. What other types of issues might we see? What other types of things should we be including in the, in the whiteboard of issues that we want to start to tackle with regards to autonomous vehicles? Well, I think you gave already a very broad uh, spectrum of all the uh, main changes. And um, I could just add that on a psychological point of view, driving is, is a very uh, human and uh, great experience. Uh, and that uh, you have to take in, to have in mind this big uh, change in uh, uh, society uh, on a psychological point of view, the reaction uh, from drivers not being in an autonomous car uh, relating to autonomous uh, cars. Uh, what will be uh, uh, a competition? What do we do with the people that like to drive? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. And uh, you have emotion, uh, could be joy, uh, could be frustration in a, a traffic jam, could be uh, anger, uh, very often, more and more <laughs> frustration. So, I mean, that's a very uh, human mm. situation when you are yeah. in your car. I, so that will change definitely too. Yeah, I, so I think the emotional aspect of it certainly is the case. So what you're saying is you're not as excited about the autonomous living room as I am. Um, it really sounds wonderful to me not to have to drive. Um, 
All right, let's keep moving on. And I do want to mention to our audience that um, this actually is an open dialogue. So let's make sure that you know uh, throughout the rest of the session, I will call on people who are at either of the microphones and we'll do our very best to bring your questions to our panel and uh, engage the room. So if you have any questions, by all means, please do jump up um, at any time, whether it's a question that is sort of in the flow of our conversation or some burning issue that you're hoping to tackle. Um, I'd actually like to come back to Sophie. So let's now talk about the role of the regulator. We've actually started to identify many of the participants. I think one of the incredibly important participants in this dialogue is that of the regulator. The regulator over the data involved in all of the complex relationships within the autonomous vehicle. Tell us how you're thinking about that. How do you see the role of the CNEEL in autonomous driving systems? And where are your efforts focused right now? Where are you placing your resources in an effort to direct this in a, in a good direction for good outcomes? Okay, so uh, first thing, at the moment we are not working directly on autonomous cars except uh, on the ethical aspect I shall speak about uh, further. But uh, for the moment, um, as I was telling you, the first uh, work we have done on connected cars, uh, we want to have that uh, pushed at the European level. So we are working on having on the specific issue of connected cars less complicated, but on a methodological point of view, you have already the ecosystem of uh, uh, many uh, actors. You, it is easier to implement privacy by design in connected cars than in, in an autonomous cars because when you were speaking about the rights uh, from the persons, uh, occupants of the car, uh, if they decide to go in an autonomous car, there are many, many data that they couldn't oppose to uh, be processed because that's uh, necessary, uh, fundamental for uh, the driving. So uh, when we have to use uh, the rights, the first one, the right of information, is vital because many, many uh, persons already now uh, don't know at all what are the, uh, the information, the flow of information uh, given to the uh, car manufacturers or the service provider. Uh, so there is really a huge work to be done on this education and pedagogical approach. Uh, the second aspect of uh, our work at the moment is, as I was um, suggesting, on the, the, the digital ethics because there is a new steering committee on digital ethics put in place last December. Uh, and uh, the, the purpose is to provide contribution uh, for determining the relevant balances uh, on the ethics of digital and artificial in intelligence. And there is a specific focus to be done on uh, the autonomous vehicle uh, to analyze the tensions between automat automation and human control in the control of the vehicle, or the question of the responsibilities uh, shared between manufacturer, insurer, user, in connection with the mission uh, that is already uh, interest by uh, former Ministry of Transportation on autonomous car. So we are working uh, in this uh, steering committee with uh, 30 personalities because you need to have a mixed approach to have digital specialists, academics, uh, philosophers, doctors, uh, lawyers, member of civil society. So that will be a, a very, uh, very interesting work to be done. Uh, but you, that's still going on. Excellent. So Sophie, you mentioned GDPR before. Um, you've given us a sense of some of the work of the CNEEL currently with connected cars, with autonomous vehicles. Um, you haven't mentioned any need for additional regulation or additional standards. So I'm actually going to let you rest for one second and put everyone else on the spot. And I'm going to ask them, is GDPR sufficient to regulate autonomous vehicles 
going forward. So Miko, I'm going to start with you and come this way, and Sophie, you get to answer last. Mm -hmm. Well, at, at least I wouldn't rush into enacting new, new privacy laws for, for, for this particular purpose. Of course, we need to uh, work towards more shared understanding on, on what are the different roles, what are they doing, what, what, should, what are the best kind of like privacy design practices, uh, what are the best privacy engineering practices, how these systems should be developed. Uh, but I think we do have uh, many uh, sort of like, 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 it seems that these problems, excluding perhaps the ethics problem, have already been solved in other contexts. We, we mentioned the smart wheel, a smartphone on wheels. Perhaps there's something to be understood uh, uh, from that environment. Yep. How, how, who, you know, what are the roles between the platforms versus those who want to offer their services on those platforms? So start with GDPR, start with existing regulation and see how this new technology demands new methods of no notice, new methods of implementing the, the protections provided in yeah. GDPR. Chelsea, do you agree? Yeah, I think that's right. I would add, um, in addition to privacy laws, I think um, industry guidance for the different players. So if you're a car rental agency, uh, what information should you be giving to your customers? Um, guidance from the regulators or from trade bodies? Where do you see that guidance coming from? Uh, I think a mix of everything. Yeah. Um, I've been lucky enough to kind of work in different sectors from private sector to um, the FBF nonprofit and uh, public sector. And I think you really need a mix of like the business, the regulator, and also talking to okay. real humans that are using it. So my experience with renting cars, when you connect your phone by Bluetooth, you always get the pop-up, do you want to share your contacts? I always say no, but how many times like, have you rented a car or gotten to an Uber and someone just connects their phone? Do you really know what data is going in there? Do you mm. really take the time to delete it? So just that type of guidance. So again, um, uh, FPF worked with uh, Autonomo to create a privacy playbook. So it's not rules, but it's more of that guidance. So I think that's really important for the different players. And then of course, we're missing the whole AI ethics element here because sure. these cars are like robots and a, the basic definition of a robot is sense, thinking, and acting. So what good is all that data? Hold that thought. That? We're gonna come back to that in one second. Andrea, do we need new regulation? Okay, this is gonna be long. Long, uh-oh. Um, <laughs> yes, we do. Uh, I wouldn't go into saying that the GDPR needs to be changed, no. Uh, but I do think that we need additional guidance, whether in the form of actual regulation or, as Chelsea was mentioning, industry and regulator uh, guidance for a very uh, simple and complex at the same time reason. Um, GDPR is principle-based. It lets you, as the entity being called a controller, decide how that actually feeds into reality. And that means different approaches. And I'm not sure that in an industry uh, where we are supposed to have uh, the entire infrastructure, not just the cars, but the cars and the streets and the, uh, and the road signs and the society as a whole communicating between themselves, I don't think we can afford not having standardization in between. Also, we will have more and more players involved. It's not gonna be just the car manufacturer. Usually, car manufacturers are not software companies. So whenever we talk about uh, very complex software needed for the car, and in particular, the AD software itself, it's gonna be provided most likely by a third party. And if we don't standardize requirements, even from a privacy perspective, for those third parties, we're gonna have very different approaches. We're gonna have uh, actors with very different um, leverage in between themselves, and we can already see this in the smartphone industry, where the uh, OS providers are much stronger and they basically um, dictate what happens uh, with, the, with the data collected by the smartphones, and the, the producer of the, of the smartphone doesn't have a lot to say in it. And I personally don't want to see this uh, potentially awesome technological development, uh, go into what is today the mess in ad tech, where we've had 
principal regulations in place, hello, <laughs> for years. I know that Alexander is, uh, is approving of this. Um, we've had principle-based regulation for years, but it's been implemented and not observed and not enforced for so many years that it's only now that the regulators are saying the industry has a problem and the industry fights back and says, well, you let us have a problem. It's very late in the process. <laughs> So I would prefer that we don't get there, so that we have guidelines and regulations and privacy by design rules for all of the actors involved. And I would also like to see a clarification of the roles of the various actors involved, because if we look at the model of the smartphone industry, because it's very inevitable not to, uh, the, pr the producer of the phone and the, the provider of the software are considered independent controllers, which means that the software provider can use that data for whatever uh, other purpose they want. And uh, as was mentioned before, the autonomous driving cars will need, will absolutely need to feed on a lot of data. And are we prepared as a society to let the software providers use that information for whatever other services that they want to develop? Because of course they, they are businesses, they want uh, value added, meaning more profit, it's normal. But that doesn't mean that ethical uh, principles shouldn't be in place and the hard limits shouldn't be set from the very beginning. And I don't think that that sort of task should be left to the OEMs. Okay, so a uh, very robust answer, and actually I have to say I'm, I'm surprised that, that uh, GDPR is a good base, principle-based, um, but with the number of players, the need for standardization, the, the complexity of third-party operating systems and software inside autonomous vehicles, you do see a need for additional protection. Sophie, do you agree? Is GDPR enough? Well, if you speak about dealing with the collection and processing of personal data, I would say yes, because this is a, a neutral uh, technology, technology neutral, yeah. tool, uh, and that the, the question of uh, IA has been uh, examined in deeply uh, during the debates. There will be the re first report uh, from the European Commission uh, at the end of uh, the first uh, semester uh, this year, uh, about the assessment of the GDPR, and we don't think we need to open uh, the box and try to add things. But it doesn't mean that uh, you don't have need for regulation, and at the moment uh, I, we are following um, with the French Ministry of uh, Transportation, because there is a, a new French law on mobility, mm -hmm. and uh, the question of access who is accessing to data is obviously crucial. And uh, uh, for example, we are speaking with uh, the insurance company uh, wanting to uh, know who is in charge. Has the delegation, the driving delegation, has been activated or not? That is absolutely crucial. And so we know that there is a draft European regulation negotiated on uh, uh, those uh, event data recorder. And uh, there is also, uh, for the black box, another data storage system for automated driving, uh, another regulation uh, to establish an international regulation of the technical characteristics of such black box. Of course, that is obvious. Yeah. And that's at the international level that it needs yeah. to be addressed. So that is on the trail. That's a, a good thing. Uh, right. And I know that uh, when we speak about uh, artificial intelligence, it, we, ha you ha we have already a lot of things about uh, uh, the consequences of automated decision for individuals, but, but still the GDPR is not addressing the collective impacts. It's only individual impacts, and we are aware of that. So, I mean, on this side, you know, see, the uh, collective impacts and how to address the various BAs uh, that you find in uh, algorithm, this is also 
uh, an area where I think uh, um, I'm not sure that would be a change of the regulation, but I, we are aware that there are things to be done there. Okay. So, actually, an interesting diversity. So, Miko, just hang on one sec. We're going to go to the question here. But an interesting diversity of responses in the panel on whether GDPR is sufficient. Some saying, yes, go slowly. Um, Sophie telling us it's, it's principles-based, so with, with regards to data, it should be good, but with some specific need for regulation around things like event data recorders and black boxes, and there is work underway on that. Um, Andrea is saying that there may be very broad areas in which we need additional regulatory work. Let's go to the question in the audience, and then we'll keep going. Hi, and thanks, Andrea. Alex Anfier from Think Privacy. I also teach data ethics at Singularity University. Uh, I think that it's really important to learn from mistakes from the past. So I have two things that, are, that I'd like to discuss. You may remember from about 2006, Trevor, um, where the police in the US were using surveillance techniques on vehicles based on tire sensors um, for surveillance purposes. So on the subject of access, which Sophie was just talking about, how do we deal with access to not just personal data, which will be covered on GDPR, but all the metadata which is created by these vehicles and the, uh, and the, the smart connected devices that we have? And historically, we've seen that this is a problem, and it hasn't been resolved. Secondly, what about legal liability? Going again back about three or four years when the first speeding ticket was issued to a Tesla car driving in mode two, uh, which was hands off, Tesla paid the ticket because they didn't want it to set a, pres a legal precedent through going to the court. We don't have laws yet to determine liability in these situations. Yep. So how do we move forward there? How long is it going to take law to catch up? And how will we learn from the mistakes of the past? So. Uh we're going to answer the first question because the second question is the big close for our panel. So you're going to have to wait for the answer to that one. The first question is, not all data is created the same. We've been talking about personal data flowing through these machines. There is an enormous amount of technical data, metadata, other types of data, and there are various actors in society who may want access to that. The state being a really big one, um, other commercial interests, uh, all sorts of different interests. How should we be thinking about that framing? Um, or are we seeing an erosion of the boundaries between personal data and all other kinds of data, where metadata and other things, um, essentially, in an environment like an autonomous car, are almost always personal? Miko, you start, and then we'll keep going through the panel. <clears throat> well, I think many, many would argue that most of the data that a car, at least if, if uh, it has people in it, <clears throat> create would, would, would be personal. I think, uh, Sophie, you've been an advocate for that, and I think that's, uh, and that's a position that is perhaps easier to articulate than the opposite position. Sure. Uh, but the, the way we should be looking at this is not necessarily to look for, for, for specific rules, but to look for how the existing rules and the way that they've been applied in the past in similar situations could work in this context. And <clears throat> we... If, if we think that the car is something that has uh, one or more computers running on it, which seems to be the, 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 the way to look at it, um, somebody puts those computers in that car, and it's probably going to be the car manufacturer. So, so, so that, that there is a natural control point in that environment. And when we look at the, if we use the, um, stretch the analogy of the mobile phone on wheels, that was a bit of a wild west, but it has matured some time ago already uh, into a model where those who provide these things, the operating system providers and the hardware providers, work in unison, uh, uh, access to various capabilities, sensors, cameras, microphones, could, in a car those would be brake, uh, engine, data, whatever. Uh, it's very regulated. It happens through standard interfaces and you, you shouldn't get access to anything unless it goes to these uh, 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 pre-designed points. So that's, that's the point of, ad, uh, of adding the, the privacy by design to it. Uh, <clears throat> what would, should be the rules that we would use to make sure that only appropriate third party access to these capabilities uh, uh, would happen? 
Again, uh, uh, Apple, for example, runs a model where any third-party application actually needs to adhere to strict standards. And they are tested, and you don't get in there unless you meet the standards. So it makes the ecosystem safe. Now there's a question of market power and how do you want to, you know, what sort of an environment you want to, to, to create. And you probably don't want to have a fully walled garden approach. Uh, but that's that's something that I think the, the, the jury is still out on, on how, how, how it will play out. Chelsea, help us understand the part of Alexander's question associated with surveillance, though. You know, clearly one of the actors involved is the government. And it could be a, a police action, it could be national security, but there may be an interest. And in fact, with technologies that exist in cars around the world, we've seen great interest from um, government surveillance mechanisms to get access to that data. As we move towards autonomous vehicles, do we have sufficient protections that exist currently in the due process around warrants and other things? Or do we need to think about this new technology in a different way? Yeah, this is a really great question and uh, it could be its own panel and in fact it was. Probably if you not. happen to catch the Uber panel just before this, it was really great and they talked a lot about um, that issue. If you didn't catch it, I recommend checking out the YouTube video about it later. Um, but you're right, so the, the go legitimate government request to access this type of mobility, micro-mobility data is an evolving space. We don't really know what the right answer is yet. but. Local governments especially do have a valid interest in some types of this data, whether it's like specific real-time location data, that's a really hot controversial area, or aggregated um, just trip um, type data when it comes to scooters. So there are at least three competing interests here. You have the individual privacy, um, and then you have the government interest. They want to know what's going on in the public right-of-way, and it's also a public interest for enforcement, um, setting policy, um, and also something that's really important in, in cities is creating an, an equitable and accessible place for all citizens in a city. And then you have the business interest in keeping the data confidential. So. Like I said, this is still a hot, controversial, evolving space, and I would just stay tuned. Wow. Okay, uh, again, I have a lot to say here. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's why I try to keep it short, because I could sense. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, first of all, I wanted to address a side topic, which is the narrowing uh, distinction between personal and not personal, non-personal data in the uh, car ecosystem because I find it nearly impossible, especially in the AD scenario, to have data that is uh, collected, and I'm looking, of course, from the point of view of the OEM, not a third party that receives parts of it. Um, from the point of view of an OEM, the thing is that all of the data that you collect in, in, at, at the very first level, not for use in a, a very given purpose, needs to be tied to the car that it comes from. I mean, this is the, the, the whole purpose. You need to know which car produced a specific reaction, whatever that means, what happened in a specific car. So you will always, always have some sort of device ID, whether it's the VIN number, wh whether it's something else. It will be a unique ID that will tie the data that you collect to a, a given device. Now, of course, some years ago, I'm, I'm well aware, as, as Sophie was mentioning, in the car industry, this was still considered not to be personal data. And I highly disagree with that. And actually, to my surprise, this was very well explained in CCPA, where they actually do say that identifying a device means identifying the person that's connected to the device. And in our system right now, that will most likely mean the purchaser of the car, because of course, in theory, we will not know who is precisely in the car. It could be the spouse of that person, it could be the child, it could be a friend, um, whatever. So there is some sort of individual indirectly tied, but still tied 
to the data that uh, is collected from the car. So that means that most of the data, if it's not processed further and stripped down of some of its elements, will be at least to some extent personal uh, data. So the safest approach from my point of view is to consider it personal data because then you, you raise the bar uh, and I think that's what we need to do. Now on the uh, surveillance side of things, just one, two, two, two minutes, two minutes. <laughs> on the surveillance side of things, um, my personal worry, looking at things from the point of view that cars are sold globally, I mean, if we would sell cars only in the EU, I would probably not be that, that stressed, but we don't. We sell globally, and all car manufacturers virtually at least want to sell globally if they don't already do it. So you expose the car to the legal environment in a lot of countries, and conflict of laws is not something that I need to explain. I'm sure people do understand that it's a headache. So what worries me is the possibility, because it's not just a probability, it's a possibility for certain, at least certain states, to want to perform real-time location surveillance through the cars. This is my worry. Yeah. And this is something that I would like to see the whole international community be worried about to understand that this will be possible. Okay, and, and to understand that this yeah. is a major, major, major risk. And honestly, as the manufacturer, when you are served with a binding order from that state to do this, what do you do? Do you not comply? Do you, do you, not, do, do you cease to do business over there? I'm not entirely sure that that's the route that is actually an option. So, we're gonna to go your to, point, I don't know. We're going to go to Miko, and then we have a question in the audience right here, and then we'll keep going to the audience. Miko. Just a uh, just quick, quick uh, thoughts and, and reactions. I, I was thinking, and we, we've been talking about this, the limitations of the uh, mobile phone on wheels analogy, and now we're talking about third parties remotely accessing data in the car. Would that not be subject to the uh, cookie rules under the e-privacy directive? Do we, I mean, again, I'm thinking like, well, maybe there is a regulatory framework that already applies. So, so wait, Miko, are you serious? they don't need to do it like that. They don't need to do it like that. They can ask the OEM to do it for them. So, to be clear, Andrea has raised the idea of device IDs and other things being associated with vehicles. Miko, I'm not sure if we've fully sorted cookies yet. I've been in that space for quite a while. Uh, we certainly do have some standards out there. Um, but it is, it is an analogy, and I think it is important. We have device IDs on phones, we have device IDs on many mechanisms within society, and certainly that device ID as associated with vehicles is going to be an important, a necessary tool for the functioning of these things. And by analogy, certainly I think we would look to yeah. prior standards for... Exactly, and the, the cookie directive does not only apply to cookies, but all kinds of tracking software. Indeed. So I think that's, that's, that's one dimension. And then perhaps on this uh, surveillance aspect, uh, uh, just to complete the, 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 the picture there, uh, obviously, the, for the connectivi connectivity provider, uh, the surveillance regimes are very well-regulated areas, and those would continue to apply here. But then it's, it's perhaps the question of, again, in this ecosystem, and there would be so many other types of, of information that is as sensitive or perhaps even more sensitive than the network-based uh, location data, yeah. that are those rules actually well-crafted, are they fit for purpose? Probably many would argue that they aren't, and, and some changes would be needed there. Too. I think it's a good question, a good, a good issue. Let's go to a question here. Uh, hello, Julia Maria Mönig from Stuttgart Media University in Germany. I'm actually working on a, a project on the ethics of autonomous cars, and my question to the panel would be, whether you think that privacy by design as a principle as it is in the GDPR could be used as um, an example for ethics by design to uh, yeah, somehow apply it to and imply it into autonomous um, driving industry. And just uh, two points to explain my question. Um, because I've uh, work, been working in a really small project and already there it's hard to 
uh, apply ethics and apply ethics by design. And um, thanks to Andrea for um, opening the global perspective because, um, I mean, surveillance is one thing. Like in Belgium already, all license plates are being scanned when you, when you drive uh, on the motorway. So, um, but um, we already have a global problem now, I guess. It's nothing new to people here, but we are already, all these great cars manufactured by European manufacturers have been assembled in countries which not necessarily uh, are taking our European values into account. Thank you. Thank you. What a great question. So we're going to start with Sophie. The question is, can we extend the idea of privacy by design as it exists in GDPR and other places into autonomous vehicles and broaden it to a concept of ethics by design? Does that sound like a fruitful exercise in your mind? Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's. Uh, I, I was just reading my notes and uh, it says you ethics see, by design, yes, right there. Exactly, well done. because uh, <laughs> I was thinking that's uh, quite uh, intuitive and logical uh, following. Um, but uh, on ethics, I must say that I was quite um, because we didn't work as I told you already. But I could uh, working to prepare the panel uh, go to some ethical rules governing uh, self-driving cars, elaborated by an ethics commission on automated and connected driving uh, three years ago now. That was in yeah. June uh, 2017. And um, that was done um, by a um, steering committee appointed by the German Federal Ministry of Transport. And uh, obviously, uh, there are some they could serve as a regulatory example. And China, uh, some officials from China were saying that uh, they could model their own regulation on them. So I think they are very precious uh, work done on uh, those uh, ethical rules to have. And you will see that that will be very useful for, for your uh, tramway dilemma too. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I share this uh, point of view, yes. Excellent. Chelsea, is ethics the right framing? Is, is it a helpful framing for managing the ecosystem, the complex layers that we've been describing so far? Yeah, so I love privacy ethics by design. Um, I think it definitely has a place in the law, it has a place in business. Um, my thing about that is, is one thing to say it, put it in black and white and in a law, but it's a whole other thing when the rubber hits the road. I don't think that a lot of people appreciate the resources, like the time and the money it takes to actually implement this in an organization that is designing products. Um, and one really hard part of that is the translation issue. When you have the privacy lawyer, the ethicist, the engineer, the product manager, and the designer, all coming from different backgrounds, speaking different languages, they really have different um, OKRs to meet, they have different values that they have to hit for the company. So to, to really do privacy and ethics by design, you have to consider all of these different people. They have to be on the team really from the very beginning of product development, not from the end, and it's a lot easier said than done. Nico, do you agree with Chelsea? Is, is ethics helpful but not fully implementable, operationalizable yet, if that's a word? Yeah, I, I think the, the data ethics is, is definitely already one of the buzzwords, and I totally agree that it's a uh, it's, it's very difficult uh, concept and takes time, and how do you do, and whose ethics do you actually apply? Uh, we uh, were faced with that problem when we were thinking in the GDPR program that, uh, about the question of what does it mean when GDPR asks you to uh, identify the uh, the impact to the rights and freedoms of the individuals of your activities. And, and, and quite quickly we sort of like came to a realization that, ah, oh, this is actually a legal mandate to do an ethics analysis, but how do you do it? So we, we uh, pondered on it a little bit and came to a conclusion that we have to root it to, we kind of like anchor it to human rights. So we now have a process that we've been piloting for a while uh, for AI and, 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 and analytics uh, projects and uh, you know, various other things, uh, where we, whereby we do a human impact assessment. Uh, so we try to, we have like a framework where we have uh, identified a number of tangible and intangible 
privacy harms, if you may, like, and, and then we apply different scenarios to it. Things like, first question that we ask, like, can someone die as a result of this? Then we think of... A good start. The, 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 yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then, then when you... Because it, it's ultimately a risk assessment, which is about likelihood and impact, so it's easy to see that the impact of that would be intolerable. Uh, but how likely is it? So, and they, we, we, we have a number of different scenarios that go through sort of like uh, discrimination, bias. Is this going to have an impact on someone's em employment? You can apply it to data breaches, to ethics, you know, probably here as well. So for us, it was a much more concrete way to actually operationalize the ethics analysis, which is for, 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 for large companies like, like what we represent here is a problem of scale, right. repeatability. So we need to, we are I think doing this a is, lot of that. I, I think this is fascinating, and I hope the audience is, is taking note of, of this. I think what we are seeing is innovation in the marketplace with regards to the tools necessary to address the concerns that we are seeing. So what Miko is sharing from Vodafone is the idea of a human impact assessment that broadens the concept of the data protection impact assessment found within GDPR to much broader human rights and other um, uh, impacts. Death being at the top of the list, which is good, but one would imagine others, discrimination and other things that could certainly be on that list. Andrea, you represent the one company that literally puts rubber on the road. So when the rubber hits the road, does something like, like this, a, a risk assessment, a, a human impact assessment, a risk register for the various consequences that may occur from connected vehicles, is that a tool that makes sense at Volvo? Well, coming back also to the previous question a bit, because uh, I, I, I want to say a few words also about that. Uh, what I find is that because privacy by design is now a, a regulated obligation, at least in the EU, it's much more difficult to uh, globalize that sort of requirement in, of course, a global company. Something that you do uh, willfully, like ethics, is much easier to implement globally. So having an ethics by design approach with your self-assumed uh, principles is much easier than saying we implement GDPR globally, which might be a mistake from many points of view. Now, uh, coming back to the other question, of course impact assessments are absolutely necessary, but I think that the moment when the rubber hits the road is way too late mm. because before that moment, there have been years of development. First, there's a concept, then there are, of course, many, many, many developments, uh, sourcing of all sorts of solutions, putting it together, testing it, and so on. So having all of the impact assessed as a whole at the end is not That's gonna helpful. work. Yeah. We need to look at the impact in smaller chunks to isolate bits and pieces that have a common goal, like uh, a certain software, a certain uh, feature, I would say, of the car, and look at it in that way. And I think this would also help from the point of view of GDPR certification, which is not for products or services. So you can't certify a software, you can't certify a car, you can't certify a system as a whole. You can only certify processing operations. Yep. So if you want to go the route of privacy certification in GDPR, tearing it down into really, really, really to the level of processing operations might be the best way to go. Interesting. So again, really helpful dialogue, I think, in terms of operationalizing many of the protections that likely need to be in place human impact assessments, inserting that process early into the development cycle within an organization so that you are not objecting to or doing a risk assessment of a fully formed product or service, but rather you are at the table when the whiteboard is blank and the engineers and the product developers are starting to think about new ideas. Um, really helpful operational controls that I think make a difference. Okay, I'm very sensitive to time. Um, we have seven minutes left and I'm gonna hold about four minutes at the end for us to answer the trolley question. So I think I saw we had one question at the back here. Colin, sorry, yep. You win. <laughs> uh, Colin, 
Bennett from, uh, from University of Victoria in Canada. I was just going through all the various instruments that are available in the GDPR, and you mentioned privacy by design, you've mentioned uh, DPIAs. Is this a fruitful area where a code of conduct mm -hmm. could be possible? Mm. I'm thinking in terms of the reputational risk here, mm -hmm. right, which seems to fall squarely on the auto manufacturer, whatever happens. And also the nature of the industry as I know it is relatively confined. It's not as complex as elsewhere. Is that a possibility? So let me just capture the, uh, the question because I think it's a really good one. And Colin, uh, all of you should know, is a tremendous expert on the various constituencies that participate in policy making in the data protection world. I recommend his books to you. And he's challenged us with the idea that Perhaps just GDPR is not the, the only answer that the provision for the development of code of conducts, independent self-regulatory mechanisms, also hold great power. Um, what do we say about this? Self-regulatory mechanisms, code of conducts, are they an important tool for industry to get out ahead of the otherwise legislative or regulatory rulemaking process that can take some, some time? Sophie. From the regulator point of view, I must say that um, I was thinking about the code of conduct and I think when it's very complicated to address an, in your own company some human problems like uh, a question of death or life or, uh, and I would think that it's not the right uh, sco scope start that you have to emphasize that to uh, have really uh, um, a diversified uh, approach with many uh, data controllers, processors, and uh, we really want to promote such code of conduct. Mm -hmm. We created uh, within the CNIL a specific department dealing with uh, compliance tools, uh, so me certification mechanisms, code of conduct, uh, impact assessment, um, and uh, I think that you have really some um, groups, um, entities, and consortium like uh, Impact uh, AEIA uh, in France, and I, I bet there will be like, we have already some cloud providers code of conduct being uh, uh, instructed by the CUPD. Uh, we will have something coming on uh, ethics matters. Okay, so Collins asked about code of conduct. The Keneal has said, uh, sorry, Sophie has said, <laughs> yes. um, that, uh, uh, that she sees it as a very powerful tool. In the interest of time, additional panelists, thumbs up, thumbs, thumbs down to code of conduct. Mm -hmm. Thumbs up, we like code of conduct, all right. Um, now let's move to the trolley problem. Um, yeah, yes, uh, <laughs> let's move to the trolley problem. Um, so, remember the trolley problem is runaway trolley, switch. If you do nothing, you kill four people. If you throw the switch, you kill one person. Now the trolley is an autonomous car driven by AI, and we are all programmers. How do we code to make this decision? Andrea, I'm going to start with you, and then we'll go down the panel and end with Sophie. Okay, I'm going to speak very fast. Okay, go. Uh, I think, first of all, that the trolley problem is not a good problem because it narrows it down too much. In real life, you don't have just two options. It's not just black and white. And also, who ties people down to tracks? Really, this doesn't happen. So let's be realistic here. First of all, the goal should be to teach the algorithm to teach itself and to actually develop the solutions based on the actual situation. It's not like the program will, you, will say, you go left. You have left or right and you will always go left. That's not gonna happen. That's not how software development and AD works. So that's my first challenge to this problem. And also, I think on a more ethical level, where I want to bring it even further, and everyone is free to disagree with me, but still this is my, my opinion, um, let's face the fact that right now, most if not all of us here do drive. And every single time that we do this, we accept the inherent risk that comes with driving. The fact that someone might get hurt, not necessarily die, whether it's us in the car or someone else because of us, in various shapes or forms. Somehow, this sort of driving risk seems to be completely eliminated in the AD scenario. Why? 
Why do we expect autonomous drive to be this perfect while the cars will, will communicate between each other and with the infrastructure, they will not communicate with humans on the road? How can we not take this as a factor into the risk? How can we expect total perfection? I think that's unrealistic. And if a state does take that risk to actually enable autonomous drive and have this sort of infrastructure, then I think the state should also take that risk and should do something like a special type of insurance. There are, for example, states that cover all of the damages when someone suffers an adverse effect from vaccines. And I'm here to say that, in my view, states should consider doing something similar for autonomous driving. Okay, in the interest of time, let's move on to Chelsea. I just want to capture, um, Andrea has questioned the premise of the trolley problem at its Hi, ab initio from the beginning. Uh, she's also suggested the fascinating idea of algorithmic ethics, that AI within these vehicles should learn how to make good decisions, and that also, wait a minute, if we're gonna cut traffic fatalities by 90% by moving to algorithmic driven vehicles, uh, AI driven vehicles, are we even asking the right question? Shouldn't be, we, we be celebrating the 90% of people who are now alive because people aren't driving cars? Chelsea. I agree with, with everything you said about that. So this question comes up pretty much every time there's a panel or anything to do with this. So I would say if you want much more information about it, Heather Roth has written some good stuff. Um, the Folly of Trolleys is one of her articles. But yes, so it's not useful in the real world because cars won't be, like individual cars won't be making one decision. As is already really clear from this panel discussion, there's an ecosystem. Every, everything in the eco ecosystem will be talking. It's not just that one decision, it's a sequence of decisions based on a lot of different factors. So it's not really useful in the real world. But I will say it can be useful because when you think about those four people that are on the track and that one person that's not, it, when we use it as a, just a pure thought experiment, if we want to play this out, and we think about, well, what types of data would we need to know to make that decision? We would want to know, who are those people? So then we start getting into... Wait, a qualitative question about are who are we going to kill? Right, so it's, it's just that thought experiment that how, how much information do we really want to know about people is one. And second, do we want machines making life and death decisions mm -hmm. and being responsible for it? So I think that that's where it's useful, just as a pure thought experiment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Chelsea... Um, agrees with Andrea, but also adds the question about, think about all the data that we have to put into that, and do we even want ma machines making decisions about that, and aren't there qualitative aspects? Miko. So my answer to this type of a question is always 42. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, but to be more precise, and Sophie, hopefully I'm not uh, stealing your thunder here, but the, the German Ethics Committee has laid out some pretty good principles here that you sh the, the, these things should be always designed to protect human life first <clears throat> over property. Uh, and then when, 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 when thinking about humans or, or people, it shouldn't discriminate based on gender, age, sex, uh, you know, condition, size, color, whatever. And, and I'm not sure how much further we can get with it. I certainly would not want to buy a car that is in certain conditions programmed to kill me. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, or, 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 or my family, uh, yeah. and, and no, no, no one else would. So I'm thinking like humans are highly unpredictable, and, and if I really had to choose, I would probably create like a random generator that just <laughs> does something. Yeah, that's actually okay. research. Yeah. Uh, the research actually shows that people do prefer the random result instead of having to choose and being responsible for someone dying. Okay. And also, in a thought experiment, they would choose to sacrifice the passenger in the car or the driver, however we call them. But when they are uh, uh, called to think that they are in the car, they don't want it anymore. So. Okay. so Sophie, what's the answer? Well, I don't pretend to have the answer, but I, again, go back to those um, work done by this ethic committee, the German one, uh, and the answer, if you follow, uh, the, the, they have this uh, genuine deli, del, dilemmatic decision to take, uh, and they say that, of course, a human driver uh, can not have a correct judgment, uh, but you can't um, uh, 
you can ask a machine, an automotive, uh, an automation, automatic uh, car, yeah. uh, to uh, make such uh, judgment uh, and uh, to transform uh, reality into an abstract general ex ante uh, appraisals. So clearly, uh, there could be, of course, uh, some learning system uh, being self-learning self in vehicles operation, but only if they generate some safety gains, and you have to try uh, to use the um, IA to to gain in safety to avoid accident, uh, thinking about uh, how to avoid the accident and not uh, taking a decision like that because it's not ethical. Excellent. Mm -hmm. All right, we have come to the end of our panel. I hope through this past hour and 15 minutes, you've gained a sense of the complexity of the technology as currently implemented, the various stages of autonomous vehicles that we heard about the complex ecosystem that exists within the vehicle itself, the number of technologies and actors that are active at any one moment within the vehicle, the complex ecosystem of players and actors within society that are involved in autonomous vehicles, the various contexts in which we will need to understand the interplay of not just data protection, but human rights and other issues. And that brings us to the answer to the trolley question, which I think you just heard. It's probably not the right question. So the answer is, we don't have to answer it at all, because this is a much more complex environment with many, many more variables. If I know one thing, the complexity of this field needs experts, and I am in tremendous gratitude to the four people to my left for bringing their expertise to you and applying their hard work and intelligence to this issue every day. Please join me in thanking them.